Uh, in 2006, Warren Buffett announced to donate like 85% of its Berkshire Hathaway stocks to five different foundations, and most of that grounds goes to Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. Tell you the decision before the announcement, and was that a surprise to you? Well, I'd been good friends for Warren Buffett uh, for a number of years, and he had given me advice about the foundation work. I was very excited about what we were doing, but uh, his wife, Susie, uh, was going to be in charge of giving away the money that he made. Tragically, she died. And so a few months after that, Warren said to us that he thought the most logical thing would be to make uh, a major gift uh, to our foundation. And it's the biggest gift anyone's given to uh, anyone else's foundation. So it was quite stunning, even though we were close friends. And... Uh, we were honored, you know, it made us think, okay, we can be more ambitious. Warren told us to go out and take risk. And so now that's 10 years ago, and, and Warren thought it'd be great if we wrote to him about how we see the overall impact of the most generous act ever made. So during this 10 years, how do you report to Warren or discuss with him about all the development of the foundation annually? Well, we get to see Warren a lot, um, and he's a trustee. So we're coming together. But this is uh, stepping back uh, and saying, what did we expect at the time? What's gone better than we expected? And just the discipline going through this writing. And there's lots of people like Warren who care about the poorest, but they don't get to fly to Africa like we do. They don't get to meet with the top scientists and see what's realistic. In fact, we mentioned the letter that less than 1% of the world correctly answers the question of what's happened to poverty over the, the last 25 years, which is that it's been more than cut in half. And as they see the pictures on the screen uh, of tough situation, people think actually that things got worse. Uh, it's, it's too bad we need to bring the good news and explain what went well and how we can do even more of it. And that's a big achievement for the foundation, and you are quite proud of it. And I noticed that actually most of the, its grants goes to either uh, both the Global Health Program and the Global Development Program. But do you have any um, plans to maybe adjust the, the portfolio in the next five to ten years? Well, our foundation's biggest effort is to make sure that uh, the health of the poorest uh, is not worse than the rest of the world, that a, a child everywhere has the same chance of surviving and having the nutrition so they can develop their physical and mental potential. And we're still far short of that. Over uh, six million kids a year are still dying before the age of five, a million in the very first day of life. And so for uh, my lifetime and Melinda's, getting rid of these diseases, malaria, TB, HIV, uh, that will remain our, our primary focus. We want to end those diseases. Uh, the only one that's close to being ended is the, the polio disease, which paralyzes children. But you have to spend over $4 billion U.S. dollars on average every year. Like, is that a burden to you? What if there's no good deal for a year? Well, certainly uh, getting great vaccines out, uh, helping to invent a vaccine for, say, uh, HIV, uh, those are unbelievable things because as soon as you have that vaccine, you'll be saving millions of lives a year. So these global health investments we're making are really phenomenal. You know, it's like investing in a, you know, Microsoft or Google. The, the, the returns are even higher in terms of the improving the human condition. The poorest, we often don't invest for them because there's not a market. And yet, uh, their needs are, are quite significant. Uh, and so uh, we're going to stay focused on solving these health problems. And uh, during our lifetime, we think we can largely solve them. And because you have done a philosophy for such a long years, have you ever think about to change the way to do it? Because Max Edward, uh think about the other way. He chose the LLC structure. Have you ever think about to change the foundation structure into more like flexible way? Well, the, that's kind of a complicated topic. There's many ways you can structure things. Uh, we use a foundation structure. The country's uh, tax laws and ways they encourage philanthropy 
I mean, there will be some variety there. At the end of the day, if you want to help the poor, you need to give grants. You need to, to give money so that those vaccines can get to them. Now, sometimes you'll have a product that, like an HIV vaccine, where uh, it'll be used both in countries that can afford to pay for it and in countries that can't. And so you want to make sure you get private companies in to help you with that uh, part where they do uh, see the customers and you get their unique skills. So how you tap into the private sector, we're always looking and being creative about that uh, because in many areas, including making new vaccines, that's where a lot of the, the expertise is. So the structure of the foundation nowadays, you think, helps you to achieve the charitable goals you, you guys set? Certainly, we, and we use a lot of approaches, mostly grants, but some investments uh, to help the companies doing those new tools. Uh, you know, including in China, we're always looking for companies that might have uh, products that can uh, have those uses. I mean, you have different roles beyond the co-chair of this foundation. How do you manage your time? How much time you can spend in this foundation? My full-time work is the work with my wife, Melinda, on the foundation. I'm an advisor to Microsoft on some of their advanced technology. I enjoy that. That's maybe 15% of my time. Uh, I'm working in some energy areas, uh, including uh, uh, breakthrough fourth generation nuclear power company called TerraPower. Uh, I think the energy space is very important because of, of climate change. Uh, but the biggest thing is, is this foundation work. You know, I'm getting out to all the partners, to Africa, to India, to see the impact of, of these big grants we're making and you know, understand uh, what, what's still needed. So how those like field trip to South Africa change your views in life and words, change your view to do the, the philosophy? Well, for example, when I was in South Africa for the Big AIDS conference uh, last year, it was to understand why our current tools that help women prevent getting HIV infection, why they weren't using them, what was it about their side effects or the daily usage or the stigma, and therefore how we could change those tools and, and drop that infection rate. So, you know, I went out and met with lots of girls in these uh, township families and they talked to me about what choices they'd made and what kind of product changes might be attractive to them. And so the scientific agenda has got to be informed about the, uh, what users are willing to do, uh, how tough it is to get things delivered. Uh, and so it's that field work informs all the, the grants we're making. In the end letter, you also uh, told us a story like you get the permission of a baby's uh, autopsy from his parents. How do you feel at that time? Well, I think it's awful that we don't know more about why young children die. You know, in very rich countries, we do lots of investigation about death. But in the poor countries where over 90% of the younger our children deaths are, uh, we don't investigate. So knowing what kind of infection uh, we might have been able to prevent, we don't have that data. And people always said, you would be too expensive and the mothers would never agree. So we had to design using the latest tools a very inexpensive way to do it uh, called min minimally invasive autopsy. And then we went out and asked parents, you know, could we look and see so that maybe in the future uh, uh, in a similar situation, the child wouldn't die. And we got uh, surprisingly very high acceptance to that. And so I in the letter talk about an autopsy uh, where I actually was present to see and you know, figure out why this child had stopped breathing um, because that was, that was so sad for the mother. Yeah, but it helps the science to get to know the data. It could help more people in the poor country. Right, which is why the mother agreed that, that we should investigate. And uh, I think political weather is another challenge for nowadays, especially, I mean, financial crisis, um, populism rising. How do you face the new normal if the, the country were just cut the more foreign aids in the future? Well, fortunately, a lot of countries participate in foreign aid. And uh, 
you know, the good news is a lot of countries that needed foreign aid uh, have developed and the you know, pace of development is very good. South Korea, is, as late as the 1970s, received foreign aid. Now they're a foreign aid donor. You know, China today uh, doesn't receive foreign aid and is starting uh, to be a foreign aid giver. And so we get to concentrate. We have more givers and less recipients. And so some of these countries, like in landlocked Africa, very tough challenge, but we now have more resources to help them. We have better science. Uh, the success stories of how that aid as having such success, we need to get that out there so that voters don't think of it that's money that's wasted or feel like uh, it has no impact at all. And uh, using this digital uh, world and, and getting out and telling taxpayers to be proud of that kind of outreach, we need to keep doing that because there are there's a lot of uh, fiscal priorities, budgets are particularly tight, but I don't think foreign aid will go down a lot. It may not go up a lot, uh, so we'll have to use what we have along with the new science uh, to have, have even more impact. How will you use the endowments from your family and the contribution from Warren Buffett in a more sustainable way? Well, if you can do something like eradicate polio, then forever after, nobody has to buy the vaccine or deal with the paralyzed child. It's gone, just like smallpox uh, is gone, and we don't spend money on that. People don't have those pockmarked complexions now because it's, it's completely a, a, a thing of the past. So the, if you can uplift a country uh, so that its health is good, then its kids can learn, and over time it develops the structures and resources to be self-sufficient. The goal is always uh, to have countries graduate uh, so we can then uh, focus on the remainder and, and eventually uh, get all countries to be uh, self-sufficient. So that's the sustainability is getting them out of their poverty trap and in some cases completely getting rid of the disease uh, and so nothing uh, has to be spent on it. How far away from our like get rid of all the epidemic flows, let's say Ebola or Zika virus, like what can we do now to contain the damage in the future? Well, when we have new diseases come along, it takes us a long time to create a new vaccine. So there's some new approaches that uh, far more rapidly, you might be able to get the vaccine. If you could do it literally in weeks, then that would become a key tool to stop a flu epidemic or a, a big Ebola epidemic. Unless we tap into that science, we're very much at risk of a, a certain type of flu that we haven't seen a really bad one since 1917. But because people travel so much, uh, they, the speed of infection would be even higher. You know, people have done movies about this. I did a TED mm -hmm. talk about this. We're not as ready as we should be. And because it's a global problem, it's kind of like climate change where you need the top governments to work together. You need China and the US and Europe all thinking, okay, let's get our scientists, let's get our manufacturing capacity. And if this came about, we'd have to coordinate a lot of our activity through WHO and by working with each other. And there is more dialogue about that, even though Ebola and Zika were a tragedy, it's reminding people uh, that whether it's flu or MERS or some unknown thing, governments haven't stepped up enough, and yet there's some science that, that should make it, if we do the right thing in the next five or ten years, we would be far more prepared. Uh, in terms of the technology, you mentioned energy before. Is there any other area you're going to bet? Because you made a bet, like many things are going to change by 2030. So in terms of technology, which technology are you going to bet? which could make the biggest change for the next five or 10 years for the poll? Well, I work uh, in the foundation where uh, making vaccines easier and better, that'll be a top priority for us because malaria, TB, HIV, we need phenomenal vaccines for those. Uh, you know, Microsoft, of course, is be using AI to do magical digital things. And then in the energy space, we have a lot of paths including uh, 
a way of storing energy that's more inexpensive, but that's very hard to do. You know, making nuclear cheaper and safer with this fourth generation. So multiple ideas with the goal that we want energy that's less expensive and has none of these either local pollutants or the global pollutants, which are the, the greenhouse gases. Um, if we look back for the previous 17 years, what the foundation could do different to accelerate the children's mortality, to accelerate its decline? Well, we've learned a lot uh, about how do you get uh, mothers uh, to understand about taking their kids to vaccination, uh, getting women's groups, uh, and this is something my wife Melinda is very uh, excited about, getting them to talk to each other. They can educate each other. If the Health Post is not doing a good job, then the Women's Voice collectively is strong enough to say, no, we demand that the vaccines be there, the worker uh, be there. And, and so they're a very powerful force in these uh, basic health issues. We didn't know that when we got started. Uh, we didn't know uh, how to form a lot of the key partnerships. So we feel the, of all the things we've gotten done, our understanding, the strength of the organization, the partnerships are probably the biggest asset we have so that we can make even more progress uh, between now and 2030 than, than we've made to date. So that's the methodology you want to introduce to the world of the philosophy to make it more efficient, maybe, to build yeah. this system. Yeah, and, and well, and we're broadly encouraging more philanthropy. You know, we're seeing in China and many other places a, a huge growth in philanthropy, and everybody brings their own ideas, and uh, it's going to be great that now uh, this money's going back to improve, improve the world. Thank you so much, Bill. Thank you for joining us today. Thank you. Really appreciate it. 在采访的最后，我们问比尔·盖茨对中国的年轻人有什么样的建议？以下就是他的寄语 ：The world has made huge progress in global health and development over the last few decades, and China has played an important role in this. I hope more people in China will join us as impatient optimists as we continue to build a world in which everyone has the chance to lead a healthy and productive life.